Hey, happy Mother's Day. As we think about this day, it's Sunday, but yes, it is also Mother's Day. Let us rejoice and be glad that this is the day the Lord has made. And let us rejoice and be glad for mothers making it possible for us to celebrate this day. Now, as a church, we don't so much focus on Mother's Day as we just do another day because I want to be inclusive of everybody on this particular Sunday. Now, Mother's Day is started around 1920 here in the United States, but it's not a holiday day that we read about in the Bible. Uh, and if it's not in the Bible, it's something that we don't necessarily feel we need to focus on. In fact, if you think about it, what did Jesus want us to remember? He didn't say, remember me at Christmas. He said, remember what I did for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So we partake of communion, celebrating what Jesus did on the cross for our sins. Um, Jesus did tell us to honor our father and mother, and Jesus, the Bible does tell us to respect our elders. And I, I think that uh, maybe the question that I would like to ask today as I lead into this is, what is the greatest advice that you could think of that maybe your parents told you? Something they showed you or told you, some great advice that you learned from your parents. Um, Johnny Cash <laughs> gave the advice of, uh, all, his mother said, always be a good boy, don't ever play with guns. And at least that's what the song says. And for me, I wrote down a few. They're not in any particular order, but here they are. <laughs> you heard this one too, always wear clean underwear. Or life is short. And I think that's right because the older you get, life is like a roll of toilet paper, the older the uh, let's see, life is like a roll of toilet paper. The closer you get to the end, the faster it goes. Another thing, help others. Never forget those who helped you get to where you were. Uh, this is one that was more demonstrated in my lifetime than it was ever spoken. I remember one winter night, my dad was driving home and he slid off into a ditch. He walked a few blocks over to this farmhouse and asked if maybe they could pull him out. And the old man said, if I can get my tractor started, I, I'll do it. So he goes out, he's got an old John Deere. He's got to spin the flywheel to get it started. It fires off, pulls my dad out. And from that day forward, every year, especially at Christmas time, we would go and see Artie who uh, lived in that house. Uh, and so it was just a way of saying thank you for your moment of kindness. So never forget those who helped you get to where you are. Here's another thing, and I think this one's very important, and it will always stick with me. It's very important to me, and that is stay close. Uh, or wait a minute, before we get to stay close together, let's do this one. Stay in your own lane. Stay in your own lane. Get your nose out of other people's business. They may be changing diapers and you don't want to get your nose caught in it. But the greatest advice that I can say today for all siblings is stay close together. One day we were out camping and my brother and I asked my mom if we could go down to the children's pond and to go fishing. And she said, yes. But she also said this, stay close together. So we were having a great time and probably throwing more rocks than we were rods and uh, fish bait into the lake. Uh, and my brother took and he cast, but he thought he was snagged up in a tree and he was yanking on his fishing rod, trying to get that hook out of the tree. It was not snagged in the tree. It was in the side of my head. Yes, the biggest catch he ever had was his brother. Uh, anyway, it, it all worked out in the end, but it's great motherly advice, and that is stay close together. Uh, and uh, love my brother, love my mom, just we need to be closer together. We are in heart, but not in physical distance. Uh, now, here's the thing. I'm also reminded of another piece of advice, and it wasn't really advice, it was direction. It was given by Mary, the mother of Jesus, and in fact, it's her last words that are recorded in Scripture. She says at the, at the wedding of Canaan, she, Jesus, she goes to Jesus and says, hey, they're out of wine. Jesus says, why are you asking me? It's, my hour has not yet come. And Jesus says, go get and fill these 10 water vases full of water. Fill them to the brim. Fill them with water. And they're large. And so they, and, and Jesus' mother says this, her last words, do what he says. Which I think are still like your mom's words, my dad's words. And like all those words of advice, they still ring out today and they're still true. Do as he says. Uh, and her words, and I think kind of like our parents' words, they don't have expiration dates on them. And, and so it's timeless advice. Some of the things in life we have been taught verbally communicated to us, and some were more caught. They were taught to us. One of the things my parents did, they would instill in my brother and I, 
dive in and try. You may not know what you're doing, but dive in and try. And as I was preparing for today, I really felt God leading me to an event in the life of Jesus uh, where something is more caught than taught. And it's found in Luke chapter 10, starting at verse 38. As Jesus and his disciples were on the way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparation that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken from her. Martha, Martha. So who is this Martha person? Who is this Mary person? And what we know is they, uh, they're sisters. Uh, they live in Bethany. Which Mary is also referred to as Mary of Bethany. They also have a brother, and the brother's name is Lazarus. The relationship between Martha and Mary and Lazarus and Jesus, very tight. When Lazarus dies, Jesus comes into town and raises him from the dead. And I can only imagine Martha in the kitchen, and she's getting a little bit letting her anger start to boil like the pot on the stove. Uh, and maybe she is clanging a few pans together trying to get Mary's attention. Well, what do you think her posture was when she came around uh, to ask Jesus to send her sister in? Did she have her hand on her hip, maybe both hands on her hip, and seeming like she was steaming a little bit? I think the key word in this passage is when Jesus says, Martha, Martha, you're worried and upset about many things. Now, I don't want to put any shame or put Martha down. I think we all need some Marthas around us, and maybe we need a little bit of Martha in us to get some things done. But the danger of being a Martha is you might overlook the more important things. This event is uh, calls for some self-examination. And that question that we need to ask ourselves in this story is, Am I a worrier or a worshiper? Do I worry about a lot of things or do I stop and put Jesus first and worship him? I believe the more time, more we spend time worshiping, the less we will be worrying. Jesus wasn't shaming Martha. Uh, that would have been uh, out of character for the Son of God to shame her. He isn't applauding Mary. He is sharing how to overcome the feelings of being overcome and that is to reset your priorities. The psalmist says in Psalm 37, starting verse 4, Take delight in the, uh, in the Lord, and he will give you your heart's desires. Commit everything you do to the Lord. Trust him, and he will help you. He will make your uh, innocence radiant like the dawn, and the uh, justice of your cause will shine like the noonday sun. Be still in the presence of the Lord and wait patiently for him to act. Now, I love verse 4 because delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you your heart's desire. So don't misread that. It doesn't mean he's going to give you the new pickup you're wanting. But that because of your time spent in the presence of God, you're going to develop an eyesight of God. And your desire will be the desires that he has. And you're going to also learn contentment with what he has provided you with and what he is protecting you from having. So never forget what may seem like God's rejection could be God's protection. In Luke chapter 15, there are these three classic parables of Jesus. A lost sheep, a lost coin, and a lost son. And in the parable of the lost sheep, Jesus says, Imagine one of you had a hundred sheep. And at sheep counting time, you start counting them and you come up with 99. You realize one's missing. Wouldn't a good shepherd leave the 99 and go looking for the one. And when the good shepherd finds it, wouldn't he love and with love and compassion bring that one back and take care of it? So before you came to know Jesus, you were a lost sheep. There were still a, a number of sheep, there are still today a number of sheep wandering. They aren't as close to the shepherd as they could and should be. And this passage is to illustrate that Jesus never gives up on us coming to know him and he is patient with us and he pursues us. His love is not based on us, it is placed on us. And I believe this passage can also have a second view. 
look at it in a different light. What if the 99 that the shepherd leaves behind was your 99, but it's not sheep, it's not other believers, that your 99 is your busyness. Your 99 is your priorities. Your 99 is your work or your other things that you do. The 99 of what calls you to be a Martha. And what if in this story, the 99 was our busyness and the shepherd is you, and the one that is not in the 99 is Jesus. He isn't lost. He isn't endangered. He just isn't with the flow of your priorities. Here's the question. Are you willing to leave what seems to be your 99, to leave your Martha worries and the day and start searching for him? And the promise of God is that if we seek him, we will find him if we seek him with all of our heart. And the beauty of this is when you find him, you hold him close as the shepherd holds the sheep close. And you, he is so close that the mouth of the sheep, the mouth of Jesus is close to your ear and you can hear his heart for you. Each of us is bombarded with distractions every single day. We can call it busyness or we can call it something else. The truth is it's our enemy. And the devil is using those distractions to steal, kill, and destroy you and your pursuit of Jesus. One of God's leaders, a man by the name of Joshua, towards the end of his life, he gathered the people together one day and he says, choose for, you this day. choose for yourself this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Um, on Mother's Day, Moms are supposed to be the MVP, the most valuable player. And in life, moms are the most valuable player. And when it comes to choosing the better uh, uh, and, and then that will not be taken away, what about if we start making Christ our MVP, our most valuable person? The M would be make time for God. If we want God to be or Jesus to be our MVP, we need to make time for him. Make time for him. Uh, Psalm 63, 1. Oh God, you are my God. Early I will seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. Early I will seek you. So make time for God. V, vary your approach. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over, expecting a different result. Psalm 96 one says, sing to the Lord a new song. Not a memorized same song, different verse, a little bit louder and a whole lot worse. It is his, his, if his mercy is new every day, why can't we come up with a new song every day? Letter P, protect the time. Like a mama bear over her cubs, protect your time with God. Protect it from interruptions. Keep it on your schedule like brushing your teeth. Proverbs 4.23, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. And if you're going to choose worship over worry, it's going to take the advice of your mother to, uh, to do it. And here's what you got to do to show S-H-O-W. Letter S, surrender. The real secret or the secret to life, a blessed life, is to surrender your life to God. Surrender your way. It's not your way, but God's way. Show, and you ask God to show you his way. You can't know the way of God without seeking the face of God. You, you're going to be looking at for billboards rather than road markers. Letter H, humility. Humility is not weakness. Humility is acknowledging you don't know it all and that you need God's help to make it. God hides secrets. God hides secrets from the arrogant. And the Bible says knowledge puffs up, love builds up. Love one another. Letter O, obedience. O, 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 uh, uh, the Bible says, for his unfailing love towards those who fear him is as great as the heights of the heaven above the earth. He has removed our sins as far as the east is from the west. The Lord is a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him him. The fear of the Lord is not running around afraid that God's going to zap you with lightning or cause the earth to open up and swallow you. The fear of the Lord is to walk in obedience to what he says, uh, to, to walk in obedience to his written word and his spoken word. 
James uh, said, don't just be hearers of the word, do what it says. Obedience and faith, I believe they walk together. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Letter W, worship. We become what we worship. Worship is to give worth to. Psalm 37, 4 says to delight yourself in the Lord. That is a verse with a promise, but there's another promise that follows in verse 11. It says, but the meek will inherit the land and enjoy peace and prosperity. Meekness is not weakness. Meekness is opposite of prideful. And God has promised that if we will humble ourselves before him, he will lift us up. For you to choose the more important, what is God through the Holy Spirit telling you to leave behind? What are the, the many things that you're worried about that are keeping you from trusting and worshiping Jesus? What keeps us from seeking him first and his righteousness? The one who gets hurt the most by not seeking is yourself. What would it look like this week? If you got up, say, 10 to 15 minutes earlier than you normally do, with the sole purpose of spending time with God in prayer and Bible reading, and in your prayer time, what would it look like instead of asking God to do things for you, you started asking him what he wanted you to do? Because if we seek him, we will find him, and that is some of the best advice that you could ever take. May God's blessing be upon you. Bye-bye.